Good morning, everyone. It is 10 a.m., and I would like to uh, call to order the Audit and Finance Standing Committee meeting for November 17th. Uh, the first order of business is the annual election of the chair and vice chair, and for that, I'm going to hand the chair over to our clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, we will be starting the meeting off today with our uh, annual election for the position of chair. So with that, I'll open the floor to nominations. And Councillor Cleary. Thank you. Uh, I'd be happy to nominate Councillor Russell uh, to continue as chair. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. And do I have a seconder? Second. Thank you, Councillor Jekyll Gammon. And Councillor Russell, do you accept the nomination? I do. Thank you, Councillor. All right. Uh, yes, for sure. Um, and uh, do we have any further calls uh, for nomination? Any further nominations for the chair? And one more time, any further nominations for the chair? All right, and with that, I will ask for the nominations uh, to cease. Councillor Purdy. Sorry, I, w I think I was just a little ahead of the game there. <laughs> All right. Uh, so can I get a, uh, um, a motion to uh, cease nominations, please? Councillor Cleary and a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Russell. All right, and all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion is passed, and Councillor Russell, uh, you are declared the chair of the Audit and Finance Standing Committee. Thank you, everybody. All right, and with that, uh, we will move on to the election of vice chair. Um, so um, I will call for nominations, and I believe Councillor Purdy. Yes, I'd like to nominate uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon, please. All right, and do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Cleary. And Councillor Daigle Gammon, do you accept the nomination? Yes. Thank you kindly. And are there any further um, nominations from the floor? One more time, any further nominations? And one last time, any further nominations for the position of vice chair? All right, hearing none, I will call for a motion to uh, cease nominations. Thank you, Councillor Cleary, and can I get a seconder? I'll second. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. All right, that has been moved and seconded. Um, so uh, can I, uh, all those in favor saying uh, aye. Any opposed saying nay. Wonderful, hearing no further nominations, uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon has been elected as vice chair. Thank you very much, Annie, for taking care of that. Um, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of October 20th, 2021. Uh, can I have someone uh, move the approval of the minutes of October 20th? Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon, can I have a seconder for that, please? Councillor Purdy, thank you very much. Are there any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the minutes of October 20, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. Thank you, that passes. Uh, approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. Um, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I would like to um, move public participation right after the uh, business arising out of the minutes, please. We have a seconder for that. Councillor uh, Cuddle, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other changes to the order of, well, 
Uh, are there any other changes to the order of business over to the clerk? Thank you, Chair. Uh, there are no uh, further uh, additions or deletions to the order of business. Okay, thank you. In that case, uh, all in favor of the order of business as amended, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda then is, um, we're going to move this. I slipped for a second. We did approval of the minutes. We haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, okay, so let's uh, just keep moving through. We have business arising out of the minutes as none. Call for declaration of conflicts of interest. Not seeing any. Motions of reconsideration as none. Motions of rescission as none. Consideration of deferred business as none. Notices of tabled matters as none. Correspondence, petitions and deletions, over to the clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, correspondence was received for item 12.2.1 and circulated to the committee. Uh, the correspondence is in the form of an email and presentation on behalf of a, a member of the public who will be uh, partaking in our public participation today. And the presentation was circulated to members uh, of the committee in the event that time runs out. Okay, thank you. And do we have any petitions? Not um, seeing. Thank you, no notification of any petitions from the clerk's office. Okay, thank you, and we have no presentations. Um, so the next item would be public participation, and speakers can participate in person or via the phone. Uh, please keep your comments respectful on topic and directed to uh, the chair. The clerk will announce when you have 30 seconds remaining and when your time is complete for all speakers. After everyone on the list has been given the opportunity to speak, I will call three times and ask if there are any additional speakers. Any member of the public who has registered with... Thank you very much. Any member of the public who has registered with the clerk's office on this matter will be given five minutes to address the topic. Some of you are here in council chamber in person and some may be participating over the phone. When I call your name, you may come up to the microphone if you're here in the room, or if you're on the phone, you may unmute, you sh unmute your phone and begin speaking. The first, the only speaker on the list that we have at this point is Stephen Murphy. Stephen, are you with us? Okay, uh, you may approach the bar and uh, Krista will help you out. And Stephen, you have five minutes. Go ahead. I'm going to read from my notes if that's okay. Good morning, uh, committee members, Mayor Savage. Um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak, uh, one that I'm very concerned about, um, and also acknowledge uh, and thank uh, Councillor Patty Cullett for uh, her interest and support in the matter joining us last fall. My name is Stephen Murphy. Um, I own and operate an automotive service center in Herring Cove, 225 Ketch Harbor Road. Um, I was born and raised in the community and have operated this business for nearly 40 years, continuously. <clears throat> Over time, I've been a proud supporter of the community <clears throat> and have good fortune of employing many skilled technicians and tradespeople and students in the area. You have in your package today a copy of a presentation from me titled Restore Equality. Finish the project in Herring Cove servicing. I've tried to keep the presentation short and to the point, but as you can appreciate, the timeline we're talking about spans 50 years. I've tried, 
um, tried to have one slide per decade. A few thoughts I'd like to keep top of your mind with the slides as you hear today's regarding the project. Priority to the sewage treatment facility being located in Herring Cove, there was a pipe. The outfall poured raw sewage, untreated sewage, into the waters of the fishing community of Herring Cove for more than 30 years. The great irony, the sewage was coming from properties outside the Herring Cove community neighboring communities like Spryfield. <clears throat> Further inequities was created when the project wound down before completion. In my count, roughly 140 properties were then left behind, unserviced, but with the sewage treatment plant. I remain the only unserviced commercial property in Herring Cove community. This creates an equity in my ability to compete locally, be competitive, and the residential property owners in the community that were left off. I don't know how many properties in Spryfield have been connected to the treatment plant since 2009 or have been approved to connect in the future, but it's likely in the thousands. And still, the project of Aaron Cove is incomplete. <clears throat> During the years since 2009, I contend the project has not received priorities it deserves. Relative to the good faith contribution that the community has part of the Halifax Harbor Solutions Project in 2016, a new servicing project in Fall River was prioritized ahead of Herring Cove. In the process of completing the project of federal and provincial funding that couldn't feasibly be used in Herring Cove, the monies for Herring Cove was redirected to Fall River to enable the scope of that project to be expanded. In 2018, although both remaining phases of Herring Cove were finally considered top priorities of HRM for funding consideration, only 2B was submitted and subsequently received funding. With the passage of more than a, another decade and now the economic impacts of the pandemic related supply chain and disruptions, the cost of completing the project continues to increase. In addition to the federal and provincial funding sources that were available in phase one and two A, $5 million was made available through the Harbor Solutions Project for the community. Although intended to benefit the entire community, 4.5 million of this amount was applied to reduce the local improvement charge for the initial phases, with no reserve taken for the future work to complete the project. You have 30 seconds left. So 2B and 4 do not have any available funding. <clears throat> the background included in the staff report, May 2005 labeled phase four properties were as future arbitrarily removed from the scope of the project. The report asserted that the cost of servicing these areas was high, the density was low, and existing development and the properties in this area were, tend to be large. I contend that the same description applies to many of the properties that were serviced in the initial project. Thank you very much, that's been five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. I appreciate uh, the presentation and we will certainly take that into consideration when we are discussing it. I have no further speakers on the uh, list who have signed up in person, so I will now ask if there are, is anyone else in the gallery who would like to speak today? 
Is there anyone else in the gallery who would like to speak? And third and final time, is there anyone else in the gallery who would like to speak? Okay, thank you. I will now ask the clerk to confirm if there are any additional speakers who are waiting to speak over the phone. Thank you, Chair. Uh, while we did not have any speakers register in advance, I uh, just want to check to see if there are any who are joining us on the phone now. So uh, speakers who are on the line, please make sure that your webcast or TV broadcast is muted and that you're listening using your phone. The Chair will announce uh, three speakers at a time to help you prepare uh, when you hear, uh, actually, sorry, there are no <coughs> names in advance. Um, so I will just open the line now. Uh, and if you are joining us, uh, please uh, um, state your name, the community that you reside in. Are there any further speakers from the phone? Are there any further speakers from the phone? Is there anyone else on the phone who would like to speak? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for taking that uh, care of that, Annie. And thank you very much uh, for everybody uh, for participating. Um, at this point, we are moving ahead with the agenda. Uh, the next item on the agenda is information items brought forward as none. Uh, we have no reports from the Auditor General, that is 12.1. The next item on the agenda is 12.2.1, Herring Cove Water and Wastewater Servicing Phase 4. And at this point, I'd like to acknowledge that Councillor Cuttle from the local area is joining us in person, and David Hensby, uh, one of the members of the Audit and Finance Standing Committee, is with us online, although uh, he is not going to be able to vote or participate in uh, the debate except through Councillor Daigle Gammon. So we do have Peter Duncan, uh, the Director of Infrastructure and Planning, uh, with us to provide a presentation on this item. And then we will have uh, the motion and the discussion on the, on the item. So Peter. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Um, I'm actually not going to be given the present presentation uh, this morning. I'm going to hand the reins over to my uh, colleague, uh, Yusuf Habush, Hab and Yusuf is a uh, program, program engineer uh, with our infrastructure planning section. Thank you, and good morning, Yusuf. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Mr. Chair, committee members. My name is Yusuf Habush, as Mr. Peter Duncan just mentioned. I am a program engineer with planning and development, and today I will be presenting to you the Herring Cove uh, Water and Wastewater Servicing Phase 4 report. Before going, to, before going into the details of the report, I would like to present the service boundaries involved with this area. The boundaries begin around the intersection of Princeton Avenue and Herring Cove Road. They then move along Heron Cove Road, turning into Catch Harbor Road and ending around Ashley Drive. The boundaries also extend to the east of Heron Cove Road to include John Brackett Drive to around Holy Stone on the Sea Road. You will also see in the boundaries map here that there are four phases being mentioned and I will get into those shortly. Back in 1999, Regional Council approved servicing the Heron Cove community with central sewer and water as the Harbor Solutions water treatment facility was in this community. Furthermore, Regional Council approves a $5 million in community integration fund for, the, for bettering the community. Then sometimes in the early 2000s, it was decided that the project or the overall project would be split into four phases. In 2005, a local improvement charge was approved for, for phase one, two, three, and the approved charge was approximately $12,300 per property with an approximate 100 foot of frontage. 100 feet of frontage. However, there was no LIC approved for phase four at the time. As time went by, by 2008, phases 1A, 1B, 2A, and 3 were all completed, all of which have used multiple funding sources applied, some of which included intergovernmental funding such as federal and provincial funding, oversized infrastructure contributions, as well as the Halifax Regional Water Commission Stewardship Fund. 
With respect to phase three, this included the construction of a water reservoir, as well as the twinning of a water main project along here in Crow Road. And this was a project that was completed by the Halifax Regional Water Commission. In 2014, Regional Council applied for funding for phase 2B under the Building Canada Fund. However, unfortunately, the project wasn't approved at the time under this program. And then in 2016, Regional Council applied for funding again and received approval under the Clean Water and Wastewater Fund. However, the decision was made at the time to pull this project as secured funding would have resulted in a relatively high local improvement charge. And at the same time, Regional Council made the commitment that Phase 2B would be its top priority for any future funding programs. In April of 2018, the Investing in Canada infrastructure program was announced. Under this program, approved projects typically receive a funding of approximately 73%. Subsequently, in, 2000, in January of 2019, Phase 2B was resubmitted under this, under this program and approved. And at the same time, the project was estimated at, at 7.9 million, with the intergovernmental portion covering up to $5.8 million of the project, leaving the remaining $2.1 million to be funded through the municipality via a local improvement charge. To summarize the various funding uh, sources, phase one, two, three, were, were completed and had, and had the approved 2005 LIC applied to the benefiting properties. Again, as I mentioned, this LIC was approximately $12,300 per property on average. With respect to phase 2B, the funding agreement is signed and is currently in place. With this funding, 27% of the project will be recovered through an LIC. However, the LIC will require council amendment for phase 2B as the municipal share has grown significantly since 2005. For phase four to move forward, regional council will need to approve an LIC for the area for this phase, along with securing additional intergovernmental funding to make to bring this project or the fifth phase into fruition. Preliminary construction estimates have already been received, and it should be noted that these costs presented on this slide for, the, for each phase are class D estimates and include a 35% contingency. It is recognized that there needs to be a need, that there, is, that there is a need to update the construction estimates for phase 2B and 4 to account for both inflation as well as the impacts of the pandemic. It is estimated that there will be a $25,000 cost savings by combining the detailed design for phase 2B and phase 4 than if each phase were to be designed separately. Also, as per the recommendation of their support, Halifax Regional Water Commission would manage the detailed design on our behalf. Finally, I conclude with a report's recommendation stating that the Audit and Finance Standing Committee recommend that Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to proceed with a detailed design of Herring Cove Water and Wastewater Servicing Phase 4 at the same time as Phase 2B. Two, approve an unbudgeted reserve withdrawal of $200,000 from the General Contingency Reserve for the detailed design of Herring Cove Water and Wastewater Servicing Phase 4. Approve an increase of $200,000 to Capital Project Account CS21001 Herring Cove Water and Wastewater Servicing Phase 4. And then finally, direct the CAO to execute an agreement with Halifax Regional Water Commission up to a maximum amount of $200,000 for the detailed design of the Herring Cove Water and Wastewater Servicing Project Phases 2B and 4. Thank you, and I'm be more than happy to take any of your questions at this time. Okay, thank you very much, Youssef, for the presentation. At this point, I'd like to open the floor to uh, any questions. We do need uh, the motion on the, on the floor first, so Councillor Daigle-Gammon, um, would you mind reading the motion and then uh, proceed with any questions, please? Certainly, Mr. Chair, thank you. I would move that the Audit and Finance Standing Committee recommend that Halifax Regional Council 1 direct the Chief Financial Officer to proceed with the detailed design of Herring Cove Water and Wastewater Servicing Phase 4 at the same time as Phase 2B. 2. Approve an unbudgeted reserve withdrawal of $200,000 from the General Contingency Reserve Q421 for the detailed design on Herring Cove Water and Wastewater Servicing Phase 4. 
Three, approve an increase of $200,000 to capital project account CS210001, Herring Cove Water and Wastewater Servicing Phase 4. Authorize a sole source award to the Halifax Regional Water Commission up to a maximum amount of $200,000 for the detailed design of the Herring Cove Water and Wastewater Servicing Project Phases 2B and 4. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. I just would like to confirm that in point one, it is the Chief Administrative Officer and not the Chief Financial Officer. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, go ahead with any questions. Um, I do have a question, and the question was, um, will the LIC charge be determined after the construction is completed and any funded partnership is applied, or will it be the previous LIC that looked like it was around 12300 per property? Go ahead, Jeff. Through you, Mr. Chair, to the member. Um, the LIC will need to be revisited once we have the detailed designs completed as they will inform a better uh, understanding and a better knowledge of what the actual costs are going to be to bring this, these projects into fruition. Once we have these detailed design costs in place, we will come back to council or to this committee and to provide them with the more accurate number for the LIC at the time. Thank you very much. Mayor Savage, go ahead. Mr. Chair, if it's possible, I know Councillor Cuddle's not normally a member of the committee, but I'd like to hear from her before I speak, if I could. I'll come back on the list after she's spoken. Absolutely, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I, this, is, uh, this has been going on for a very, very, very long time. Um, you know, over 20 years, this community has been waiting to see the completion of this project. And uh, they were promised water and sewer in exchange for hosting the uh, waste treatment plant. Um, and, you know, over the last 20 years, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that very few of us were around when this started. And, um, you know, here we find ourselves today trying to move this forward. So um, I just want to thank staff for bringing this forward and, um, and for Audit and Finance for considering it today to approve the next phases of design. Um, I just have a couple of questions for staff. And one is, um, I'm, it's noted that 2B has funding attached to it, but phase four doesn't. And I'm wondering if when we're when we're calculating the LIC, um, it will be based on the the design, the the next phase of design. But will we be applying for additional funding for phase four? And how will that? How and when does that get factored in to the LIC? Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the for the uh, question, Councillor. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, It'll be at council's discretion when to apply for more funding when a program becomes a available. We, we will in all likelihood need to make some assumptions about getting funding when we come back to council with the amount of the, of the LIC. And is the funding that's secured for 2B able to be spread across phase 2B and 4? Or is it specific to 2B? It, it is, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, it is specific to Phase 2B. And it, um, we, now we did get an uh, extension to the funding when the pan pandemic happened. And uh, so the funding program has been extended to, I believe it's March of 2024. Yeah. Okay. And are there any other considerations um, in terms of determining how the L what the LIC will be? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, maybe could I just ask in, 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 in terms of um, different fund, funding sources? Yeah. Yes. Yes, there's going to have to, have to be to, to, to hold the rate. Um, I would expect in order to hold the LIC uh, to the rate that was established in 2005, even when you account for inflation since then, um, there's going to need to be other sources of funding brought to bear. Uh, so staff will be, will, you know, will be looking, looking at that. Okay, um, thank you. You know, I think that this is um, obviously we need to move forward on this, and I think moving to the more detailed design to get more accurate 
um, estimate is uh, is critically important for next steps. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. Uh, Mayor Savage. Thank you very much. Further to uh, Councillor Cuddle's comment that none of us were around, I think the, the gentleman who may be hanging on the line from the Eastern Shore what might have been around in Council or MLA, having first been elected around the time of the Second World War and having served ever since then, Councillor Hensby, and I'm sure that he's, if he is listening, he's anxious to tell the whole story here. Um, so thank you to staff for this. Thank you to Mr. Murphy for coming forward and, and uh, uh, explaining the circumstances of his business, which we certainly understand is, is challenging. I do remember back when we applied for funding under the Build Canada Fund, I guess it was at the time, we had submitted, as I, I'm just going off the top of my head, I think we submitted seven projects and we didn't prioritize them, but the provincial government put a cap on the money and they, they, they cut what was available for Heron Cove and at that point in time, Councillor Adams, who'd fought hard for, the, for water, uh, recognized that there wasn't enough to do the project and, and there was in Fall River and it was an exchange for the commitment that we get this done that I think that that happened. So both Councillor Adams and Councillor Cuddle have been strong proponents of, of, of getting this done. So would this, so for phase four, uh, Peter, um, I'm sorry, what's your first name? Yusuf. Yusuf. Uh, would, would that would come under the, the, the green stream of funding that, uh, that the feds and the province have for infrastructure, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct. It is under the ICIP green stream of funding. Right. And where are we on that? Like we, we would normally submit a list. Uh, how much money is left in that? And uh, how, how accessible is that for us? Um, I don't have the answer off the top of my head. I'd have to go back and respond to you on that. Because it seems to me that when they announced these funds, there was, um, I don't know, I'm shocked, but something like 200 and some million dollars available for for Nova Scotia. Now on the public transit fund, we get the bulk of that because we have the biggest public transit, but we don't have that same assurance under the green, green stream of funding. But I'd be interested in finding out how much is left in that and making sure that we have enough that we can uh, finish the, the last phase of this um, project, which is what we're gonna need in order to get it done, I think, Peter, right? Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Mr. Uh, Chair. Yeah, we're going to need some some kind of senior senior government level funding to make this you know to make this happen to keep it a affordable um, and that's going to be part of the when we come back to uh, council with the final with the final estimates we're going to have to either make some assumptions or have some more information on what the funding source might might uh, be right. but we have made the commitment that this would be our priority finishing Herring Cove correct The commitment was primarily for phase 2B. I don't believe there was a commitment made for phase 4. So how do we get, how do we, when would, are the TED deadlines for submitting this? I'm just wondering when, when we're going to know and when we can give people the assurance, because I do think that uh, there was a commitment here um, um, to get this done. And I wouldn't call it uh, senior levels of government. I would call it other orders of uh, government, frankly, but mm -hmm. um, that's just me. Um, so maybe you can get back to us, uh, somebody, just in terms of when we're going to be able to apply for this and what the timelines might be so we can start to figure it out. Anyway, listen, thank you very much for, for the work and uh, let's see if we can um, get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I don't see anybody else on the list. I do have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is, is uh, we are sole sourcing this to Halifax Regional Water Commission. Are they aware that this is coming and have we been in discussions with them? Uh, and the second one is, is more a discussion, I suppose, is should we include a timeline uh, when we expect this detailed de design to be done? Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, um, Halifax Water are aware that this is coming down the pipeline. That's part of the report. There is an attachment of them recognizing and the allocating the necessary resources to complete the detailed design. In terms of timelines, typically, with 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 the pandemic that's and all this all the all the issues that's been happening the, with the construction industry, it was kind of difficult to nail a time to have these designs completed before going out to tender. So we would have to wait and see what the timelines are. Typically, these projects take around between four to six weeks for a detailed design of this scale, but we don't know at this at this stage of an exact timeline. Okay, thank you. My my concern was simply that this would be held off uh, again at somehow. Um, 
At this point, I see no further speakers on the list. Councillor Purdy. Sir, I just have one question about the LIC. Um, it said that with no funding, it would be about $63,000 per property for the 63 properties that it would af affect. But with funding, that would obviously drop that price. What is the the span of time over which, like, what is the impact on the property owners? The, is, is there like a, how many years that this gets uh, to, to have to be paid off or is it attached? How does that work? Can you just explain that to me, the LIC? Um, so the LIC, there's a mechanism to calculate the LIC. It goes and it depends on the type of property, the area of the property and the frontage of the property as well. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, but we, uh, we do have, as per the L100 bylaw, the ability to calculate as we see fit what this LIC charges. Um, but in the past, it, we, it's just been a mathematical calculation based on area, property use, and so on. And then we would present these numbers to council. And in terms of the, in terms of the funding piece, the more funding that it is available to subset the municipal share of this, obviously, then that's going to be translated and moved towards the residence portion. And typically, the residents, I believe, have a ten or twenty, a ten-year timeline to to pay off this at a fixed interest rate for that ten-year ten-year span. Ten years. So, but you just said that there's there's wiggle room with with staff to decide how that works. It's not wiggle room is, uh, in terms of how the timeline is, but in terms of the calculation of the actual charge. So how, the, how we come to the determination of the LIC is what we're able to, to influence. However, the timelines, I wouldn't, wouldn't be sure if we're able to change that much. Okay, I'm just wondering if there could be an exception because prices of everything are going up. I mean, this, this can be just one more you know, that straw that breaks the camel's back for someone who's struggling with food prices and gas prices and electricity prices. It just it seems to be a very pressure-filled time that we're in. And knowing the importance of the infrastructure to be built and to be done, absolutely. Just thinking of the impact to residents that may already be struggling. There's a way to help lessen that impact. I'm going to ask the CFO, Jerry Blackwood, to uh, weigh in on this topic. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and to Councillor Purdy's question. Uh, for the most part, our local improvement charges around pavement, sidewalk are, are 10 years. Um, water uh, local improvement charges, we, I, we do have, I believe, the ability to go to 20 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the, the former LIC uh, for Herring Cove is a is a 20 year L LIC because they are to your point uh, much much more uh, expensive um, uh, to the property owner so they they're they're uh, uh, amortized over a longer period so uh, I believe the one we just did in Fall River was a, a 20 year LIC as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I see no further speakers on the list. So all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Great. Thank you very much. That motion passes. The next, I and thank you very much, uh, Peter and Youssef. Okay. The next item on the agenda is 12.2.2, the second quarter 2021-22 financial report. And for that, we have Dave Harley. Good morning, Dave. We will have a presentation first and then the motion on the floor.
Good morning, uh, Dave Harley, the Director of Accounting and Financial Reporting, and I'm here this morning to take you through the second quarter report uh, for the financial update. So we'll begin with our general rate surplus. Uh, as of the end of the second quarter, we're projecting a surplus of $11.2 million. Uh, primarily, this is due to an increase in our detransfer taxes of about $15 million. Uh, we had the previously reported uh, delay in the receipt of the fall debenture, which has pushed back our principal and interest payments uh, for the current year uh, of about $9.6 million. Uh, we continue to see an increase in our permit revenues coming in, uh, which has uh, benefited us to about the uh, amount of $4 million, and then we have seen a decrease in our compensation of benefits this year of $2.9 million. Offsetting these increases, uh, we have an increase uh, in the RCMP contract costs uh, for an expected retroactive payment, so we're expecting that to come in around $6.7 million. Uh, we continue to see increasing fuel expenses of $5.2 million, uh, which is uh, really imp uh, impacting our transit and our fleet costs. Uh, the emergency housing funds we've uh, utilized are $3.7 million, and we've also seen an increase in OCC expenses of around $2.9 million. So those are some of the big ticket items that are uh, really impacting the uh, surplus we're gonna be reporting. Looking at the uh, outstanding risks and opportunities, uh, we've identified risks. Uh, there are still additional impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic that uh, may come into play, uh, depending on how that uh, impacts things around our, re our recreation and uh, our transit, things like that. So the transit ridership levels we've identified still haven't really returned to uh, any sense of normality uh, pre-COVID. Uh, we always are aware of the uh, potential impacts of winter-related events, uh, so those can have a significant impact on us late in the year and really impact the uh, level of surplus or deficit that we end up reporting. Commodity costs, as noted, fuel costs uh, continue to increase, so we have potential of uh, salt increases with the uh, uh, strike at the Windsor Salt uh, uh, facility. Uh, there continue to be inflationary increases and uh, supply chain issues which are causing stock shortages. That's driving up some of our prices that we're seeing uh, in many areas of the organization. And we also have the potential for uh, housing costs that we're not aware of. Uh, on the opportunity side, uh, we do continue to see strong growth in our detransfer taxes, and we are continuing to see those permit revenues uh, grow this year. So we're looking to potentially have some additional out there, but uh, it's too early to say. Moving on to our councillors' funds, uh, we have our district councillor fund or district capital fund. Sorry, uh, of a total budget of three million dollars uh, year to date, we've uh, committed or spent one point six million dollars, which uh, leaves us with one point four million dollars available to spend. Uh, in terms of district activity funds, we had a budget of seventy-two thousand dollars. We've spent a little over thirty thousand dollars, which uh, has a remainder of forty-one point five million dollars available for councillors to spend uh, through the end of the year. And you can see the details of these in attachments three and four of the package. Moving on to the recreation area rates. Uh, we started the year with a surplus of $1.3 million in these accounts. Uh, we've received revenues of $885,000 uh, offset by the expenses we've uh, reported so far of $680,000, which has brought that surplus uh, as of the end of September up to $1.5 million. Looking at the reserves, uh, we have projected available. We have a projected available balance uh, in the reserves at the end of March. Uh, we're projecting to be about three uh, $305 million. Uh, moving out to the next few years, uh, we can see with the uh, expected or the commitments that we have in place and the expected revenues, we're going to be moving up to $315 million by 22-23, $323 million by 23-24, and up to $371 million by 24-25. Uh, and if you look at attachment six, you can see more details on the uh, different reserves that, that are in play there. Uh, in terms of uh, aged accounts receivable, we have uh, a total accounts receivable of $411 million. Of this, $365.7 million was related to property taxes. Uh, this was at the end of September, so those property tax bills had actually just gone out. Uh, a large chunk of that has now actually been received, so those numbers uh, would be uh, much lower at this point in time. Uh, local improvement charges made up $12 million of that. Uh, PILT was $25 million, and uh, just general revenue was uh, around $7 million. For capital projections, uh, we had a net uh, budget available for spending uh, at September 30th of $380 million. Uh, we had spent up to that point $63 million of that. We have uh, an additional projected expenditures up to the end of the year of 195 million. So our, we expect our work in progress at March 31st is going to be in the area of $122 million. And that will be carried forward into the next year. Moving on to the hospitality expenses. Uh, these have still been curbed uh, 
quite severely by uh, the impacts of the COVID pandemic. So we have uh, up, we've spent in the last quarter just $169 on hospitality. Uh, and again, that uh, detail there is uh, available on attachment nine. And finally, uh, our expenses for reportable individuals. Uh, again, uh, a lot of this is travel costs, which have been largely curtailed in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, for the quarter, we're uh, reporting just a grand total of $2,200, and uh, year to date, we're up to $6.5,000. Uh, you can also see the uh, details on that uh, uh, there on the slide and in attachment uh, 10 of the report. And then other than that, we can move on to questions. Thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Dave. Uh, Mayor Savage, would you mind putting the motion on the floor and then proceed with any questions, please? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'll put the motion. It's recommended that Audit and Finance Standing Committee forward the second quarter 21-22 financial report to Regional Council for their information. Thank you. Do we have a second by Councillor Cleary? Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, um, thank you for the, uh, for the work here. Just a quick one. There are $305 million in reserves. How does that compare to sort of the same point? I'm recognizing <laughs> reserves go up and down depending on what time of year it is, but how does that generally compare to recent years? Uh, well, last year was a bit of an anomaly uh, uh, with the uh, $31 million we had from the Safe Restart Fund that went into the reserves. That kind of brought our reserve numbers a little bit higher than usual uh, last year. But the $305 million, uh, it is a little bit higher than uh, we had seen in past years. Uh, what we are seeing, though, is a lot of those, uh, there's a lot of work that's going to be committed out of those funds uh, to fund some of the strategic work that's going on uh, down the road. So we have a lot of uh, plans in place for those funds that are there. The $31 million restart, didn't that go into operating? We had uh, we received 46 million dollars in the uh, operating fund, so it, uh, that was received in the last year. We utilized 15 million dollars of that in our last fiscal year, carried over 31 million dollars in the reserve to be used in this fiscal year. Right. Yeah, we're so we're using that in this fiscal year to balance fiscal the budget. Year. So my favorite topic is the deed transfer tax. Um, first of all, is it normal at the end of the second quarter to just sort of have a ballpark as opposed to the specific number? I see 15 million. That's normal, is it? That's sort of depending on when checks are coming in and all that sort of yeah, stuff? It, it's uh, dependent on property sales. Uh, yeah. So as those properties are sold, that'll increase those amounts. So any large properties that are sold could have a potentially larger impact, but uh, we don't have line of sight into whether one of those sales actually are going to occur at this point in time. So uh, we have a, uh, an estimate based on uh, the trends that we're seeing and uh, some of the larger ones that we may know about, but there may be other ones that we are unsure about at this point in time. Right, but that $15 million surplus is based on the first two quarters, not on the whole year, right? It's, not... it's, uh, it's our projection for the, for the it's where a projection. we're going to end up at the end so, of the year. Yeah. Okay, okay. And I don't know if you know the answer to this. I'm interested in Normally, that's very heavily commercial as opposed to residential. This year, with the market, uh, residential market as it is, um, any sense of how that's changed between residential and commercial uh, deed transfer? We uh, have seen a large increase in the residential. Uh, we actually saw that start last year because uh, we didn't have a lot of those large commercial sales that uh, drove the deed transfer tax. A lot of the increase we saw last year when we also had a large surplus in that was a bit driven by the residential market. Uh, this year, we're seeing kind of a little bit of a mixture. We are seeing some of those larger uh, commercial uh, sales come back into play, which is driving up those uh, the e-transfer tax there. But we're also still seeing a lot of that growth in the residential market as well. So the 15 million is a projected surplus over what we budgeted, which was what 60 million? Uh, yes, we budgeted 60 million. We're projecting to be around 75 million. 75 million, and uh, the year before that, it was 40 million, I think. So last year we we put it up. So that was a wise thing to do, was to recognize that the dividend of the growth that we're seeing is not in commercial taxation, it's actually in the deed transfer tax where we're getting the benefit of the, of the growth. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. I don't see any further uh, speakers on the list. So all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Great, thank you, that motion carries. The next item on the agenda is 12.2.3, increase in the capital account for fleet expansion. Uh, there's no presentation for the item, uh, so we do have staff on hand uh, in order to be able to answer questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dave, for the, uh, for the presentation on the, uh, on the financial results. Uh, Councillor Cleary. I'd be happy to put that on the floor, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, I move that the uh, Audit and Finance Standing Committee recommend Halifax Regional Council, one, approve an unbudgeted reserve withdrawal for $300,000 from the General Contingency Reserve, Q421, and two, approve an increase of $300,000 to Capital Project CV21001, Municipal Fleet Expansion for the purchase of six new vehicles. Thank you. Do we have a second or Councillor Daigle Gammon? Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. I just, um, you know, it's important obviously that uh, when we hire staff, uh, especially those that have to go out and travel for their business, they have vehicles, uh, and I appreciate that. The report does mention, um, you know, obviously trying to prioritize more sustainable types of transportation. So I wonder if staff can just speak to, you know, the it talks about uh, fully electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, uh, standard uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. Uh, having looked around the marketplace for some vehicles recently, um, I know with supply chain issues, I went into the Dodge dealership at Bears Lake. They literally had one vehicle in the showroom and about a quarter of their lot was full. So how challenging is it right now to try and get vehicles, specifically ones that are sustainable, uh, and, and what are the kind of machinations you're going through to, to be as sustainable as possible given what's available at the present in terms of buying vehicles, because clearly these people have to have a vehicle to get around in. Good morning. Oh. Thank you. The uh, floor is yours. Danielle Perez, coordinator of corporate fleet. Um, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. We are experiencing significant lead times getting vehicles, ICE even. And one of the things that like we have been doing to try to be sustainable is to put our tenders out for hybrids, Very um, first of all, because we do know there are hybrids in the market. But just to give you an example of lead time, we do have a tender right now that we put out um, five, five months ago for seven hybrids, and we're still pending getting those. So there is a significant challenge getting vehicles. One of the things with this particular request is uh, assessing the need and the timeline of the need. We, we don't want to go with ICE, but if the need to have the vehicles and have the staff in the vehicles, we will we will look to that option um, just as a as a stopgap to get us through. But we we are we are recognizing that there are challenges and on the electric side even as well. And I know it, it's the report spoke to you know some of the higher end vehicles may be available. So you do, if you do have to go with like a BMW or a Tesla, we do have a corporate car share available. Um, so maybe, maybe we could trade that little Dodge out for a Tesla that we could drive around in. Just kidding, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danielle. I don't see any further speakers on the list for this item. So all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. That motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, the next items on the list are the grants committee and there is nothing from that. Uh, committee members, there's nothing. Motions, there is nothing. There is no in-camera section. There are no added items. Notices of motion. I don't see any on the list. We have had the public participation section. So the date of the next meeting is December 15th, 2021. And can I have a motion to adjourn, please? Mm -hmm. Councillor Cleary, thank you very much. We stand adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody.